Hello everyone, um, I'm actually going to be recording this video lecture tonight from outside, as you can see, a little change in scenery. Um, I'm hosting um, some family here, so a couple toddlers trying to go to bed means uh, I can't make a whole lot of noise. So I'm going to be out here doing this, and as I promised, I'm going to be trying to keep this to a half an hour to not make it too uh, burdensome uh, on your all the stuff that you've got going on this weekend. Uh, in preparing for next week and, and a bunch of official readings and all that kind of stuff. Um, I do want to reiterate quickly before we get started here that if you um, do have questions about um, utilitarianism, this content deontology stuff, and the virtue ethics stuff, uh, or ethics of care if you want to talk more about that, or any of this stuff about kind of how to get into morality from a theoretical point of view, and how to critically reason about it, any kind of remaining stuff that you want to process or consider about the possibility of truth um, and argumentation around these matters and all the controversies that come up there, I am a very, very willing conversational participant with you, and I look forward any time a student gives me a phone call and wants to talk more or meet outside of class. So given that um, we've got classes canceled for Tuesday as well, and that means more of this stuff is going to be happening through uh, video lectures. So for the, for the 260 people, um, this isn't what you're used to. For the 360 people, we usually get to count on seeing each other at least once a week, but not this coming week. So um, all the more reason, uh, since you'll have less opportunity to like, ask questions in class and chew on stuff together, um, that I really encourage you to uh, look me up, to call me up and touch base and, and connect about anything that you're, you're kind of still have questions about or just want to kick around a little bit if you're chewing on it and, and thinking about it. Okay, so let's get into this and finish up Aristotle. Um, where we picked up, to pick up from where we left off, you got the kind of, I, I always think of Aristotle's having almost two components to his theory. The first part is about how we figure out the purpose of life, which is going to be the ultimate metric for Aristotle in judging what's going to count as virtue. I mean, we haven't really been talking a ton about virtue, um, just in the sense of like good and bad characteristics. Um, but virtue can mean something much more specific. And I've sometimes used this way of talking about virtue as well, where it's about character traits. And Aristotle is going to define these, um, and, and this is how most virtue ethics talks about, as uh, these dispositions um, for action then that's uh, like we can think about like tendencies or someone's personality or when we say their character or uh, growing in your character maturing these sorts of things are are not just um, raw analytic things but uh, a part of the side of us that Kant called inclinations um, for Aristotle the definition we're gonna get for de dispositions are really uh, or what what sort of defines our character are uh, tendencies or dispositions to feel certain specific feelings of pain and pleasure under su certain circumstances. Um, and that's going to get us into the kind of the second phase of more or less Aristotle's psychology, his moral psychology, how he thinks we work. Um, and this is important for figuring out how do we actually achieve eudaimonia, this human excellence. How does it actually manifest? And for Aristotle, it manifests in our character. But character is, so it gets a lot of importance for Aristotle, but really in the sense of when he says, we care to know what is good so that we can live it. And those are two, two different things. So figuring out like what is the ideal human life is what we've been talking about so far. Um, the next question is, what do you have to be like in order to actually live that life? And that's, that's what we'll be touching on here. Now, the, con the content that I'll be lecturing on is not Aristotle's full virtue theory. This is really just the theoretical foundations of it. Um, I'm working off of uh, the text, the Nicomachean Ethics, and we're really just talking about what's happening in books one and two of, of that work. And there's actually 10 books <laughs> that make up the Nicomachean Ethics. And a lot of the other books have to do with Aristotle going into detail about particular character traits, particular types of virtues, like a virtue for courage, or the I talked about the virtue of friendship with Aristotle before, or honesty, or generosity, or all this kind of stuff. So he goes into a lot of great detail about this, and at some stage we're going to have to. 
but we don't have a ton of time to talk about Aristotle, so I just want to kind of give you the roadmap for the, the kind of the theoretical structure that he's going to be running whenever he wants to talk about any particular virtue. Okay, so I've got a little map here um, from my lecture notes that I'm going to pull up. Um, this is where we were before um, with this stuff. I'm actually, maybe I can even, ooh, look at that. Now you can see me too while I look through the lecture notes here. So I'm skipping ahead. Bip, 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 bip. So here we are. Here's Aristotle's moral psychology or his theory of action, which has to do with dispositions and states of character. So here's a kind of formal uh, principle to define a disposition. A disposition is composed of particular pleasures and pains such that in some given situation C, a set of circumstances, a certain person, a subject S, with a certain disposition D will feel pain or pleasure P. So this definition is relating a bunch of variables to each other. Um, a state of character is not an actual feeling that you have. But it's more about like the program, the psychological program that you've got going on of when and where you're going to feel certain certain pains and pleasures. And of course, you've got a lot of these programs running simultaneously. And so in any given situation, a bunch of them may activate. But even if they don't activate, they're still with you. They still uh, are... Of, are um, sort of latent in the background, right? The, the program is there even if the conditions aren't being met for it to activate just yet. Um, so pain and pleasure is not something that Aristotle thinks of as intrinsically good or bad. It's not like pleasure is good and pain is bad. That's not like utilitarianism here. Um, remember I talked about how for Aristotle um, a good human is sort of like a properly functioning human and how we function is in terms of these dispositions for pain or pleasure so how you feel could be in a in a exhibition of you properly functioning and how you feel could also be a way in which you are malfunctioning under this kind of view um, that uh, so the pain and pleasures themselves can't be their own metric of whether they're appropriate or not and that's a really big difference here from the kind of epistemology and the value judgments of something like utilitarianism. Okay, so here's here's the map that I wanted to talk about. Um, so um, virtue is not itself the the end, <laughs> and I think this is a common misconception with Aristotle and virtue ethics that a lot of times what virtue ethics is presented is is like the virtue is the point. And I don't think it is for, for Aristotle. Um, the virtue is really important um, because of it providing the means whereby you're actually able to live this excellent life that we talked about last time. So take a look here at, we've got these two sides of ourselves in the map, uh, our rational side of us um, and this character side. And character, this is very, very close to Kant and the self-generated uh, laws versus the laws of inclination, although there's some pretty big differences here with Kant too. So Aristotle doesn't fit into really the utilitarian side or this Kantian ethics side perfectly. He's got some things that are similar to both, but he he's his own thing here. This is a, a different type of way of framing what's going on with us. But Aristotle does see us having a kind of rational component to who we are, that we could be doing excellently or not excellently, but then there's also excellence to be found in our character, and the character is really just defined in terms of our dispositions, okay? And then we also have this little bubble here that I'm calling action, and another one called the end. So there's arrows pointing all over the place, and I want to <laughs> break down what all these arrows mean. So um, let's start just in terms of the psychological aspect to it. So Aristotle believes that based on what your dispositions are, under different circumstances, those will trigger you to feel certain types of pains and pleasures. And those pains and pleasures will determine how you're going to act. I put an arrow here with an X to indicate that Aristotle does not believe, like Kant does, that reason can direct your will all on its own. It's actually inert, motivationally inert. 
re rationality is not you writing your own programming. Um, for Aristotle, your actions are really determined by how you feel. And that's something that Mill believed too, but Kant disagrees with. Okay, so how you feel, these pains and pleasures, are going to lead you toward or away from certain actions. So on a really basic level, Aristotle's saying, you know, if you feel, if you find something pleasurable, then you're going to be drawn toward it. You're going to take actions that pursue it. If you find something painful, you recoil from it, and you'll avoid doing those things or avoid those circumstances. Um, the reason why pains and pleasures can motivate particular actions is because a very interesting thing Aristotle says here. He says the pains and pleasures are they're not universal. It's not like when Mill is talking about utility and disutility in this abstracted sense. Um, it's kind of like what Kant said about this, about how uh, we don't desire happiness, we desire a particular conception of it. For Aristotle, pains and pleasures each have their own unique uh, flavor to them. They have their own unique character or content, and they're not um, commensurate. They, there isn't this, like, um, like in utilitarianism, some, like, common currency of pain and pleasure that you can um, kind of weigh, like, oh, how much pleasure am I getting from this object versus for, or experience for this one, right? They're all unique for Aristotle. And so um, when I do an action, I am acquainted with the pains and pleasures that are intimately connected with that action. And when I do that action repeatedly, that's going to change my dispositions, um, kind of like in a case of like addiction. Um, except this is just like a natural aspect of all human psychology, not just separating out addiction as its own like extreme special case, like you, you have addicts and people who are not addicts. Aristotle's like everything works like this. Um, habits are really dispositions that are trained by continually exposing yourself to the pains and pleasures of a certain action. So if you do something over and over and over again, you'll acquire some dispositions that really serve to um, reinforce that action. So there is this kind of weird um, cyclical trap or loop, <laughs> like like in the cycle of addiction, right? The um, I do the actions to gain these feelings, and the feelings make me want to do the actions more, right? So the more I do the action, the more I'm going to have dispositions that are going to determine me to do that action more and more and more. And if that sounds a little sad or hopeless or something, like hang on to that thought. We're going to come back to that. What could interrupt this process? Or what does this mean about cultivation of virtue for Aristotle? Okay, but then we also have this end. I need to talk about this too. So... The end is like some kind of purpose or function. Um, it's, a, it's the goal, and it's determined by function. Um, remember, the, the proper end is going to be defined by this whole excellent life stuff. Like, what are the things humans are capable of doing, and then with this criteria about which ones are higher and lower priorities. So the action that would be the right action is the one that is actually going to uh, fulfill this purpose or do the uh, uh, make this end occur in an excellent way. Um, and then if we knew um, what the right action was, now we can figure out how we need to feel. So uh, that would get us to do that action. And this is how we determine, this is what I have down here in the map as determining virtuous and vicious dispositions. So. The dispositions just are what they are, right? They get us to feel pain and pleasure under different circumstances. But if you ever ask yourself the question, like, how should I feel about this? Is it a good thing for me to feel this way about this or not? Um, the, the feelings themselves can't tell you. They're just always going to be self-referential. <laughs> They're going to be like, yes, because I exist. And that's that doesn't really have any accountability to it. The way that Aristotle has an epistemic model here is to say, that's why you need the first part of my theory that's all about defining what the excellent end of a person is. Once we've got that figured out, then it's just a matter of physics, really, and reason is the thing that sees this connection. Will this action achieve this end or not? It's really just like practical knowledge about how the world works to see if I care about achieving this end, what am I going to have to do to do that? So you might be wondering, like, what do I, you might, let's just do a really simple cartoonish case here. So let's say your end is to pass this class. 
what are the actions that are going to be needed in order to accomplish that? Well, you'll have to know something about causality here, right? <laughs> or maybe read my syllabus and see how the grades break down. Like, I'll have to do this assignment. I'll have to do this assignment. I have to come to class every day. You know, all these very discrete actions that are going to result in this end being accomplished. And then once you know what you're supposed to be doing, reason also is able to make this judgment uh, to be able to see potentially, if it has wisdom and knowledge, um, what ways you have to feel in order to get you to do these actions. So this is really psychology. So this, this connection here between an end and the right action is really just a matter of physics and causality in kind of the outer world. Um, and then this other connection here is about the causality of psychology. That if I'm feeling these sorts of pains or pleasures under these circumstances, will that get me to do the right action or not? So, uh, again, going back to this like really simplistic case, um, I've got a rule for myself. If I'm trying to get some grading done, don't have a beer. And my reason is that I know that if I have a beer, I'm going to feel certain ways that will make me not motivated to do my grading, right? Or to write all those emails, you know, or something like that. So um, I purposely don't put myself in that situation, or maybe I might try to... Uh, affect the way that my character is set up so that I will make sure that I'm doing the action in the in the right way so or to take like homework or something I mean this would work equally for uh, for the grading thing too um, if I've got a character that has a tendency towards procrastination then I'm like that's not a, a way I ought to feel if I care about achieving this end that's not going to be helpful right to 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 have this procrastination character thing going on, to have that program running is going to get in the way of me doing the actions I need to to achieve the ends that I have. And this kind of psychology, you don't have to be a psychologist in order to do. You're already doing it a lot. We all psychologize ourselves and each other. It's like part of how we understand inter interaction and how to have a relationship with people, um, what way to, to, to navigate that space. Um, I've done a lot of work in cognitive science and philosophy of mind, and we often talk in those fields about just like a folk psychology, the kind of psychology that people are just running as a part of their normal everyday lives. We track how we feel, and we recognize how our feelings make us act in certain ways. And we do make judgments about like, well, this is the way I really want to be living. How do I cultivate the right kind of character for that? And now let's go back to that concern about um, this uh, cyclical loop here. And before I go, actually, before I go to this, I want there's a metaphor I want to give you um, that I think is helpful for understanding this whole picture, um, and especially this part about how dispositions control our actions and reason isn't able to um, affect our will directly, and yet it still is able to see all these connections. This, is, this knowledge can only come from reason, according to Aristotle, because feelings of pain and pleasure are kind of like short-sighted. They're just impulses. They're like, ooh, I want that, I want that, I want that, or whoa, 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 get away from that, get away from that, get away from that. That's it. They don't look ahead, right? They don't see how the action that they're promoting you to do, that they motivate you to do, might achieve a certain end or not achieve a certain end or anything like that. Um, they're just, they're very short-sighted according to Aristotle. It's our faculty of reason which lets us reflect on this stuff and kind of look at it and see, oh, this thing will lead to this. Means, ends, rationality. Um, practical skill and knowledge. This kind of stuff. Um, here, I'm going to turn on a light. Oh, maybe... Or maybe not. Let me see. Here. <laughs> One second. The, the sun is going down here. Alright, that's a little blinding, but... Maybe it's a little bit better. Okay, anyway, let's, let's just wrap this thing up. So, um, so I got a little metaphor for all this. Imagine a car, and you are the car, the entire car. And there's someone driving the car, and then there's a backseat passenger. The thing driving the car of your will, uh, the, like the will might be like the steering wheel, right? Um, maybe with the engine involved too. Anyway, the thing... Your car moves, right? and when it's moving, it's acting. And where it's headed, you know, is determined by the actions that are taking place and 
whether those actions are going to get you to a certain destination or not is sort of the connection here between action and an end, a purpose. So the thing driving you, the thing driving the car in the metaphor, are for Aristotle, are your dispositions. Um, and they're just kind of like turning the wheel, like, ooh, I want that, or like, whoa, get away from that thing, this kind of thing, right? They're the one in control of the will, really, and the thing that directs the direction of your action. Um, but it's reason, sitting in the back seat, it's the passenger that has the map. The driver doesn't have the map. The dispositions can't see what's going on or where it's all headed. The reason thing can. It knows, hey, we need to take the left here if we're going to get to the direction we want to go. And if we take a right, we're going to go really far away from where we're trying to go, this kind of thing. And reason can't uh, affect, it doesn't hold the steering wheel. Like the backseat driver here in this example can't reach over and start pulling the wheel. Okay, that's what you are. Your rational and intellectual side is kind of like a passenger on a runaway train. It can see what's going on, but it has no power to affect the outcome, at least all on its own. But let's go back to the car metaphor. If we're thinking, you know, how is, how is this knowledge not going to be something totally useless? And maybe even a, a instrument of torment, right? Like the, the passenger who can see the runaway train is about to go off a cliff and they're just, all they can do is know it in dread, right? They can't affect the outcome. The knowledge is, is functionally useless. How is that not what's going on here? Well, Aristotle thinks um, he he has some he has some claims that I have taken and extended to be able to give an answer to this. So Aristotle doesn't come out directly and say this, um, but I think it's heavily implied, and I think you would very much uh, welcome my um, extension of of his claims here. So imagine the car example again. How can reason, the backseat driver, affect the direction the car is going to go? Well, I can't do it by grabbing the wheel directly. But what if it can get the driver to listen to it? If you have, I, I like to call these uh, dispositions here, um, reason-responsive sentiments. If you have reason-responsive sentiments, that is, you've got dispositions to feel pain and pleasure in reference to what's going on with reason. Like, if you find uh, arbitrary action distasteful, painful, if you find contradictory actions painful, if you find hypocrisy, double standards, all that kind of stuff, something painful, um, then you will acquire motivations to listen to what reason is saying. Even though reason can't act directly, it can do this. Or if you take joy in acting consistently, or if you take joy or pleasure in doing what's good, things like that, then reason's got its foot in the door, right? If the driver wants to just ignore the backseat driver, they can. But if they're listening to him, then they then that's a way in which the backseat driver can affect the way the car is going to go, is if the driver's willing to listen. So I think in terms of us being able to cultivate our own virtue, in other words, to take the knowledge that we might gain from life experience to change our dispositions, requires having these reason-responsive sentiments and, and having them pretty strong in us so that we can do work on all those other dispositions that we feel that aren't in line with doing the actions that are going to promote this excellent end for Aristotle fulfilling the excellent life, right? That's going to be the story here. Um, but how do you get those? How do you get reason-responsive sentiments? It might be that Kant is right, and there's a basic respect we have for reason no matter what. That's sort of just innate to being a rational creature at all. I'm not sure Aristotle's willing to go that far that Kant would. And even if he doesn't go that far, there's another story he tells here about an, an option for how this can work. And that's mentorship. Aristotle's really big on this. He says, no intellectual virtue or excellence is innate. You have to have life experience and learn how to think before you're going to gain knowledge. And with character experience, uh, character excellence, he thinks the same thing is true. People are not born innocent or born with virtues. These are things that have to be built. And you aren't probably going to build them naturally. 
just left to your own devices, it's just a jungle <laughs> of dispositions. And who knows what life experiences are going to be thrown at you that are going to modify your dispositions. And there's no way to trust that that's going to go in the right way, that you're going to get the right disposition set up. So Aristotle thinks this is why all of our virtue is dependent on other people, ultimately that we need other people like caregivers or parents or mentors or something like this to help just force us to do the actions that we might not want to do but if we do them then we'll acquire the right kinds of dispositions here's an example I don't like to jog I like playing sports you know I like to do athletic things but jogging I'm just like no so bored I have an old friend of mine from college who I was actually in an electronic band with for, gosh, seven, eight years, something like that. Very long time. Known him for a long time. He loves jogging, and he has always been trying to motivate me to do it, too. In fact, a lot of the music we wrote, he, he was inspired to, like, <coughs> sorry, make music that he would want to listen to while he was jogging. Um, and... Uh, and he's always told me that he's like, Tim, if you just do it and do it repeatedly, then what is going to feel like something you don't want to do will quickly become something you do want to do. You'll become acquainted with the pleasures that are involved with running and the pains that are involved with not running, <laughs> like when you're not keeping your body in a healthy state. Um, so he, I might need, I, I still have, I'm, I don't jog a lot. There isn't a happy end to this story. But if someone came around and was like, Tim, you're going to have to jog or we're going to fire you from your job or whatever, right? Like they might be using coercive force to like do force me to do these actions. My character is going to change in the process. I'm going to start building new habits as a result of being acquainted with these different pains and pleasures. Um, and then maybe I will be able to do this on my own once I've got that habit built up. And for Aristotle, I think that's what's going to happen here with reason responsive sentiments. That really the thing that um, our caregivers and mentors can train in us that's the best thing they could ever give us is training those reason responsive sentiments. And then once we've got those, we don't need the mentors to help us with every little thing that we want to work on with our character, although they could be helpful for that too. But um, at that point, now we're going to be able to work on ourselves. I will lean on my dispositions that are the reason responsive sentiments to get me to do the things that I might have other dispositions that are opposed to, to kind of rub off those sharp edges. I've got some tool now to work with inside of myself where my reflective activities with reason can actually start making a, a change. Okay. It's never, uh, there's some really interesting um, ramifications of this for Aristotle, that it's never a matter of pure willpower. Because your willpower is all based on just your feelings. Like, it, you can't change how you feel about stuff just by willing it to be different, Aristotle says. But there's hope. You can get help from other people, and you can develop these reason-responsive sentiments where you can now have something in your motivational toolkit to leverage on the other dispositions that you have. So Aristotle thinks none of us pull ourselves up from our bootstraps. Um, maybe we, out of luck, have the kinds of experiences that shape virtue in us. Um, no one was directing it. It just sort of happened. Um, but even there, Aristotle's like, that's not the full excellence. Because one thing remains. You still would have to know that acting that way does produce the excellent end and do it for that reason. So uh, that's where especially I think the reason responsive sentiments are important to Aristotle. That's my textual basis for it, is how much he thinks the intentionality behind uh, doing these things is also a part of the good state for your character to be in. So that's the reason responsive part. Because he's very clear that reason can't directly control your will. Okay, so um, I'm coming up on 29 minutes and I promised a half hour here. There's a lot of other cool things to talk about here, but at the bottom line, just keep in mind for Aristotle this the vision of the ultimate end here or goal being creating the excellent life which is a pluralistic combination of a lot of other excellences and a lot of other virtues um, what is sometimes offered as Aristotle's like categorical imperative or principle of utility is this rule the in intermediate but it is not playing that theoretical role this is just a 
helpful guideline that Aristotle's offering us to remember that um, what is usually the best way of operating is going to be something between the extremes. It doesn't always work out this way, but this is a really, really famous quote from the Nicomachean Ethics. Aristotle says, um, virtue is to feel pains and pleasures, the dispositions, at the right times, with reference to the right objects, toward the right people, with the right motives, the right reasons, and in the right way. It's kind of like how a fine uh, wine taster, an excellent wine taster, is really sensitive to all the different nuanced aspects of how the wine can taste and what could be good or bad about that. I used that example with Mill before, the wine tasting thing. And to be a good person means kind of having the same kind of sensitive connoisseurness about humanity itself, the human condition, um, the, the human equation of all these different things that are valuable and worth developing in yourself and making yourself into a better person. And you don't want one of those things to like overstep and, and jump onto the other ones. And we do this all the time, Aristotle thinks, where we're focused single-mindedly on certain things that are good that we want for our lives and that we want about ourselves as people to the neglect of other things that also matter. So that's why he thinks this the usually under most cases, and he's very open about exception cases, that most of these things are going to be some kind of moderation. So a really quick example, um, take the virtue of courage. Aristotle thinks courage is a intermediate between recklessness and cowardice. Um, fear is a kind of pain, and fear of dangerous situations is what's relevant here for courage. So you need to feel the right amount of fear about dangerous situations so that you don't enter into them needlessly when there isn't good cause for it. That would be being foolhardy or reckless. Um, but also not so much fear that it's debilitating and keeps you from doing going into dangerous situations when that's really called for, okay? when there's some other important purpose for doing so. That's really courage for Aristotle. It's not fearlessness. It's feeling the right amount of fear that will get you to act in the right ways, right? Going back to the model from above. Okay, I think this is going to be good for Aristotle. There's, there's a bunch of other things we could talk about. Some really interesting contrasts here between character and skill and why reason is such a big deal for him. But um, I think this is, this is going to be pretty adequate for us. And if you want to take a look at the lecture notes or read more than Nicomachean Ethics and ask questions, by all means, go nuts. I'm always like totally encouraging of students to get more ambitious with their studies here and dive deeper if this sounds interesting to you. Um, I think Aristotle's one of the more popular theories among the students I've taught in the past just because it's so like practically driven and maybe also pretty intuitive and you're probably already enculturated into it by going to school honestly and like working toward a career that you're already in a mode of trying to sell of self-improvement and trying to empower yourself to be able to achieve certain types of excellences that might be a paradigm you're already very familiar with um, but keep in mind, there are there is some objective standards here about which things are actually worthy goals. What is the excellent life really to look like? Um, there's a, be a bunch of things I'd talk about that happen in book 10 of Nicomachean Ethics if we had more time. But keep in mind, there's this criteria for this balancing act. And not to get obsessed around one thing and neglect all these other things too. Um, that risk of over-specialization is going to keep you from being... An example of human life at its very best, of a eudaimon person. Okay, so I'll call it there. Um, thanks for watching this little supplement and helping us move things along. I'm very excited to talk about fiduciary duty and uh, Friedman, Boatwright, and Hosnos next week. Um, so we'll be doing that. And stay tuned. I've got more updates coming. And I hope you have a good weekend.